With the majority of what we have covered in the past, the thought of the general population turning into mindless zombies or sporadic infected was an unsurvivable scenario for a majority of people. But what if we turned that up a notch? What if the infected could literally turn into creatures born out of your worst nightmares or something that looks like something out of Junji Ito's Fever Dreams? Keep in mind, today's video will contain spoilers because some people need a spoiler alert for a video that discusses the story and concepts of a full series. Today, we talk about the Monster House, no Monster Apartment, Parasite Maxim, and Attack on Titan called They Want Their Creatures Back. Let's ruin our multiple encounters with the monsters by playing the same Imagine Dragon song four times. My boy Mu Young returns from Kingdom as a weapon savvy dude who crafts dying light like weapons. The man with the katana has the power of God and anime on his side. Boss Baby ain't got nothing on this. What does your heart truly desire? I want a lot of hair. I want to go fast. I want to make gains. I want to suck dudes dry. What's more powerful than a katana? A weed whacker. The tank's little brother became the tank's big brother. I see what you did there. Humanity's need to satisfy its own desires will be its ultimate undoing. And humans are the real monsters miniseries itself. Today, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Sweet Home's monster outbreak. Based on the webcomic series of the same name from 2017, this 2020 drama series takes many inspirations from its source material, but also has many divergences. Both series, however, still go over an outbreak of monsters taking over South Korea from the eyes of the residents occupying the Green Roof Apartments. These horrific and otherworldly looking monsters being created from the very people they hunt and sometimes devour. At first, it seemed to be some sort of a virus that spreads to humans via the smelling or consumption of tainted foods and liquids and possibly even the blood of other infected. However, the means of infection are still mostly unknown and labeled by the South Korean public as a curse rather than an actual disease spreading unknowingly. So it might be like the Walking Dead virus where everyone has it, but there has to be a trigger that causes you to turn. The calling card of someone falling victim to this affliction will be with the first initial symptom of a nosebleed. This profuse leakage of the nose will often be followed up by the individual suffering through numerous bouts of fainting, aggressive behavior, and auditory hallucinations. The voices and sounds a person will hear are actually emanated not from a degrading of their psyche or mental disorders, but actually from an unknown entity that seeks to manipulate them. Varying between each mind that it encounters, it will seek to expose your most hidden and greatest desires and prey upon them. Once someone has been afflicted by this curse, secretly labeled the Crew Crew, it can take anywhere between a few moments to over a day to start a physical and mental transformation. The variation in time solely depends on the willpower of one's soul, and if they can resist the immense temptations that this voice in their heads creates. For many people, fighting back against this voice that preys on their weaknesses and desires will not be a long endeavor. If one lacks the mental strength to fight it back or withhold restriction to succumb to their desires, then their personality and behavior will slowly and soon drastically start to change. Sometimes during this process, it may seem like a person's former self breaks out of this control occasionally to conversate with others, as seen with the gentlewoman in episode one, who eviscerated her cat and then tried to beg for Hyun's aid. While it may have been her own conscious briefly appearing and panicking over not knowing what caused the gory scene to occur that was at her own hands, the transformation she was undergoing probably allowed her consciousness to appear as a ploy to lure unsuspecting and or solitary victims into a bloodbath, which in a worldwide initial outbreak could see to the easy infection of helpful people or the effortless slaughter of loving family and friends coming to their aid, which each latter part is interchangeable. 
Some of the cursed will act peaceful and give food to others in order to infect them or at least lure them into a trap until their cover is blown and they mutate further into the monsters that they are becoming. These mentally diverging people will slowly start to physically mutate before becoming complete monsters, restructuring their body into various means of deadliness and destruction. As the woman at the door had already had her arms mutated while it tried to hide its new physical evolutions to uninfected personnel. These monsters can take on any number of forms, ranging from tentacled, leech-tongued beasts to muscle-bound, tank-like abominations. The monsters have an insatiable hunger and will try and hunt people down to devour their flesh most of the time, as well as any available food nearby if their desire so wishes. Their extremely violent and brutal nature will cause them to attack anyone, and if attacked in any way by any entity, will fight back with reckless abandon, as seen by the steroid monster when pierced by the eyeless goblin. They will, however, hesitate to attack other infected, no matter what stage of the monsterification process they are in if they haven't already been infected. High-pitched sounds will debilitate them because they do have an enhanced sense of hearing, and this makes them very sensitive to loud noises as well. But for the most part, they are nearly unstoppable killing machines. Causing any severe damage to them will only slightly deter their pursuit. Unlike the generic form of destroying the brain or removing the head like a generic zombie, the monsters of Sweet Home's universe had the capability to regenerate any part of their body over time, except for the head. However, even cutting the head in half will not outright kill them, but leave some monster variants permanently blind. Others have shown to be shot directly in the head by crossbow bolts and just brush it off. Even dozens of shots from military-grade sniper rifles only serve to shake their body, but cause no real harm over time. Electrical shock to the body will only slightly incapacitate them as well, even when this shock is introduced directly into the inside of the body through a bladed weapon. However, they can still feel pain to a certain degree, especially when they are lit ablaze, which coincidentally, the only real way of killing a monster is by completely mutilating the body, chopping it up, or just completely wrecking it, and then completely incinerating the body, making sure nothing is left behind but charred remains. Attempting to reach out to others through electronic means in an emergency will be nearly impossible. Each and every monster also emit electromagnetic waves that will disrupt all wireless communications, rendering all internet and telephone usage inoperable, unless these are used through a wired connection. But besides the innate abilities and durabilities of every monster, each one will have its own unique characteristics that they will use to hunt you down and do what it may with you. The diversity of the monsters you will run into and possibly even become rely on your deepest desires. And context clues as to what these desires may be are uttered by the very monsters themselves after they have turned. As they frantically walk or hastily jolt across their environments, each one will utter a phrase to themselves. Whatever this deep desire is will determine what the inner voice will force your body to mutate into with many different variations and unique abilities. The first mutation encountered was the Starving Monster, a former human that was forced on a strict diet by her career that pushed her to near starvation. Her bodily pains from hunger and desire to eat were easy for the crew crew curse to exploit, causing her to fluctuate between being in control or not, but growing impatient when the prospect of eating was taking longer than expected. Those of this desire will grow numerous sharpened teeth, but have their eyes become inoperable as they go into an unworking, chameleon-like fashion. Their reckless appetite will cause them to go into such a fury that they will even bash their heads into structures numerous times. They can leap long distances and rip chunks of flesh out of people in moments flat, but their full capabilities were not explored as it was killed before full monsterification. The Lotus Root Monster, or after its injury, the blind monster that looks like a gremlin that grew up, was born from an alcoholic who carried with him a murderous desire to kill his boss. As it groans on saying to kill, it can morph its arms into sharpened spears as well as stretching those very arms at high speeds to impale targets on the fly. Despite its head being cut in half, the body was able to make up for its loss of sight by increasing its capabilities of hearing by even magnifying its ear size. As it blindly walks its environment, scratching walls and surfaces, 
trying to listen for easy victims to penetrate. The only reason for this monster's demise was its encounter with the steroid monster that pummeled it, threw it out of a 14th story window, and later devoured its regenerating body off screen. A more iconic mutation of the tongue monster having a leech-like tentacled tongue coming out from its japing maw. The monster can propel this leech-like tongue at high speeds in order to pierce through solid objects like concrete and steel. Its primary objective is to puncture the bodies of human beings like a mosquito in order to drain the victim's body of all its innards. This short process will leave nothing behind but a hollowed out and dried husk, consuming all that was inside meaning its desires could have possibly been an insatiable hunger once again, but this time to overindulge to the point that it drains others. It can penetrate through multiple bodies and hardened structures, but has a limited distance of a few dozen meters. They will strategically hide in dark corridors in order to surprise attack unwary prey, like inside concrete tubing from a construction lot while it waits patiently for alone survivors to attempt to reach safety, only to have a group attempt to rescue them, allowing it to have more humans to consume. So, if you are within its reach and you don't even know about it, you will find yourself with a gaping hole in your body, falling to the ground, an empty sack of bones. Eyeball monsters, possibly derived from a peeping tom or a person that desires to watch people against their will or knowledge, have giant multiple eyes as a growth in place of its head. Its new head can stretch up to 14 stories high to survey areas to scout for victims. It won't initially attack at first glance, but when it finds a human that notices it or it feels threatened, will extend its neck even further to constrict the victim's body completely until they either die of asphyxiation or until their body is crushed under the sheer pressure like a boa constrictor. Cutting off its neck will not kill it, however, and the rest of its body will wander off without any means of sight until it can grow numerous but not as impressive eyes in the gaping wound that it left, and eventually will evolve to become a semi-sentient human with a lot more to see. Then we have the overly muscular creatures known as the steroid monsters that will utter the words protein frequently, either when wandering on their own or even during the assault of humans. They are most likely derived from bodybuilders or people that are obsessed with working out, that want nothing more than to get as swole as possible. Their body will turn a pure white as their expression becomes a permanent smile as it allows the curse to give it ridiculous amounts of muscle mass and strength, enough to punch through solid concrete walls and pillars. And even finely sharpened katanas could even barely cut through its nearly hard as iron flesh. It will grow irritated and grow a scowl if its strength is mocked, or if it is assaulted by humans or even other fellow monsters, leading it to either pummel its opponent to a bloody pulp with its iron fists, or for it to charge recklessly enough to even plow through a concrete wall and fall 12 stories only to survive its plummet. In the web comics, it was seen eating the bodies of other monsters like the blind monster in order to heal itself as well as to gain more muscle mass. Because protein is needed for them gains, bruh. If allowed to live in its current state and exist for a mere few days, it can grow upwards of nearly two stories tall into a larger titan-like beast capable of throwing and destroying an armored car and overturning an entire fire truck and withstanding the same fire truck ramming into it at full speed numerous times. It seems nearly impossible to kill it without extreme methods. It would be able to take gunfire hellaciously and being cut up, as it took an entire vehicle to pin it on a metal spike at the end of a ravine, and then having to push a flaming freight to pin it down further in order to burn it alive. It took an entire vehicle and a half and a burning crate to kill this thing. This monster could easily wipe out hundreds of humans with little to stop it unless you had the plot armored convenience of the characters in Sweet Home. 
We could also encounter spider-like monsters adorned with multiple sharp legs that can maneuver through tight corridors and ventilation shafts at quick speeds to eviscerate victims with their jagged and sharpened legs. Maybe spawned from a desire to trap people or maybe be Spider-Man? Either way, its spider-like appearance isn't only for show. Charlotte can create and spin silk webs extremely fast in order to either envelop victims in cocoons for later feeding or to create create nooses to hang survivors and choke them to death. Them being able to maneuver through venting in small spaces will allow them to breach any safe haven you may have established and have you ripped apart, eaten whole, or served in a to-go cocoon for later consumption. If they do take damage or their body starts burning, they can detach one of their legs to get away and prevent being killed by the cleansing fire and regrow the leg at a later date. Another monster had been born from a man who wasn't able to reach his son before he was ripped away from him by these very monsters. And after dealing with the immense guilt, the entity within his head preyed upon his desire to be able to never lose that reach again, transforming him into the reach monster. It could sneakily grab you in dark corridors by stretching out its elastic-like Luffy arms and expand its hands to giant proportions with great enough force to grab people and fling them around at will. You can meet your maker by them by either strangling you or crushing you to death with its giant hands. We then can face a man who wanted nothing more than to be the fastest, or in 90s Sega terms, gotta go fast, leading to the speed monster, a human who's retained much of its human-like appearance, but with a more bulbous head, a bright beating heart visible through its chest, possibly due to cardio, and giant calloused hoof-like growths on its legs, developing digitigrade, walking on its toes and keeping its heels off the ground to allow it to run at high speeds, much like fast-running mammals, fast enough to almost seem invisible to the naked eye, and tackle people with forcible momentum. They could easily catch up to anyone trying to escape by vehicle or any other fast methods, or catch people off guard and splatter them in a blurry flash. A horde of these bastards coming at you at that speed would seem near impossible. One monster can be born as similarly to its former human, the security guard, as possible, while still wielding a, it, it, it wields a weed whacker, somehow capable of cutting through a steel katana as well as cleanly cut through a man's arm in one swing. Look, don't ask me how, as any typical weed whacker can't even cut through a finger cleanly. I guess his monsterification took control of the weed whacker, giving it enough force and sharpness to cut through a katana and a man's arm in one swing. Anyways, he lumbers around slowly, able to rotate his head in an exorcist style full 180 degrees, while a litany of flies swarm his head, making him blind and slow. He will slowly approach you, and if you get too close, you will be chopped into bits. Now, not every monster will be derived in the nature of violence, as one slime monster saved a child from harm when a group of terrorists attacked the apartment building. Although, it is theorized that this monster was actually the child's deceased father. But, that is all hypothesis, but this is a clue that not all monsters are hostile, but their percentage of non-hostility is low. Now, there is a grace period before someone becomes a monster called the Golden Hour, whereas someone who is infected before full monsterification will not harbor the ability to regenerate parts of their body after traumatic injury and they will not pretty much be immortal, as it was the case for Sok Kim, the abusive husband who desired respect and ironically hair as he wore a toupee, which he did begin to grow a ton of hair heavily from his head, but was killed by his wife with a blunt pipe to the head before he was able to mutate completely into one of these nearly invincible beasts. For most average citizens, this will be the only method of being able to kill a monster within the safety of your own home or safe haven, as being able to mutilate its body enough to be immobile and then proceed to burn it within a short amount of time may not be possible. When someone has a nosebleed, you're going to have to pretty much kill them before they turn, or if you feel lucky enough, you can risk them becoming a half-monster. If you are one of the lucky few 
who can become a half monster and by lucky few actually being someone with severe mental trauma. For instance, we do have the mother in the show whose baby had died in a tragic accident, leading her to push its carriage around daily long after its death, the carriage being empty, leading her to be strong-willed enough to fight off the entity's voice, which when it came time for her to mutate, she was able to will herself into becoming a giant prenatal fetus that would cause no harm to anyone. She just wanted her baby back. It's a little weird, but it does have an interesting concept of being able Able to will yourself into the monster of your choosing. It was also the case for the main protagonist of the story, Hyun Su, who was a social recluse that suffered from suicidal tendencies after being hellaciously bullied and his family basically disowning him. He carried with him the desire to basically end his own life, as well as disassociate from people. But through the events of the show, he learned to fight back against it by wanting to live alongside people he learned to love, which gave him this bridge between humanity and monsterism. Being stuck at a crossroads of wanting to fulfill your own desires and overcome them. Those that exist as half-monsters are able to withstand fatal injuries like falling from multi-story heights, being crushed under heavy blows, or many other various means of being outright killed to any normal human being. And once they have sustained these fatal injuries, all it takes for them to really recover from it is to take a short nap to rest it off, mimicking the nearly unkillable characteristics of the monsters they try to often avoid becoming. If they are able to resist the temptations of their new inner voice long enough for a total of 15 days to be precise, will harness themselves within a self-created cocoon and enter a dormant state for an undetermined amount of time and be indestructible. Monsters within the surrounding area will defend the cocoon in its dormant state and will flock to its general area if approached. Once this cocooned individual has had enough time, they will emerge from the cocoon almost as the same person, but with the ability to regenerate their wounds near instantly, as well as regrow severed limbs, even being able to reflect bullets from open wounds back at their assailants. That's right, a bullet can enter your body and they can just shoot it right back out, effectively becoming evolved human beings or special infectees. One such evolved being, Ihyun Jo, who, due to his split personality disorder, is able to isolate different desires, and with it, a litany of powers that allow him to transform his arm into bladed weapons to cut through enemies, and even use his own blood to invade the bodies of deceased hosts and take control of them to puppet them around and stealthily invade groups and trick people while also being able to keep his consciousness alive by stealing the bodies of others. Hyun Su was able to achieve his full evolution and adorned a multi-thorned beast of an arm that was able to fully destroy and absorb the body of Lee Hyun Jo in a pretty much prototype Alex Mercer-like fashion. Basically, saying a fully evolved human-monster hybrid can pretty much have the same capabilities of the main protagonists and antagonists of prototype. So what if it happened today? Well, upon the onset of this monster outbreak, many people will randomly suffer through profuse nose bleeding, leading people to believe a possible widespread respiratory or sinus infection was breaking out. And before medical, military, and government officials could discern the root cause, many people would already experience these inner voices speaking to them and digging into their minds and desires. Before knowing what this entity truly is, many desperate and terrified people would give in to these desires, as we saw with the president of South Korea in the show falling victim to this very curse on live television. Nobody is safe from it. In the first day or so, many would have their minds altered and slowly replaced by this entity and attempt to trick other human beings into dangerous situations and traps in order to kill them. After this time period, widespread panic and chaos would ensue with a litany of monsters invading neighborhoods, streets, and cities, causing massive destruction and countless amounts of carnage. Steroid monsters and the tentacled tongue monsters were able to cause plenty of death and destruction in their wake alone as individuals individual beings. But armies of these monsters of indescribable variations would see it easily taking out a huge chunk of our population within just a few days. Being almost indestructible by common means, requiring extensive bodily damage to the point of total mutilation, 
also followed by cleansing fire, as stated earlier, would require weaponry that won't break or run out of ammo after repeated use, and then something that can set a target ablaze completely in a short amount of time. Unless you have bladed weapons or enough assault weaponry to pretty much reduce them to mincemeat, and then if you have a flamethrower to burn them, you're not going to be able to take them down easily, which in theory wouldn't be achievable for many common folk out there, even for the more doomsday prepared individuals. Considering how they can break through solid structures with their sheer power, slick themselves into fortifications through tiny holes or ventilation shafts, or even use their transformative state to deceive others before sinking their teeth in. And even if you find yourself well-armed enough to fight back and are able to kill your fair share of monsters, you probably could not do so alone. And at any moment, you or those around you could fall prey to the curse's voice. Depending on if you, your loved ones, friends, or people you meet under these circumstances have the mental fortitude to resist the temptation of fulfilling their desires, or if you can resist that temptation as well. Of course, the telltale sign of profuse nose bleeding can have you or someone else be quarantined or even killed during the golden hour before becoming a threat that can easily be killed. But with a lot of people, some may have this occur out of sight and try to conceal it, but the task of hiding it will be difficult as having gallons of Kool-Aid leaking from your nose, passing out, and having bouts of aggressive behavior are more than noticeable. But also, the morality of killing another human being that hasn't turned yet will come into question as well. And while they are debating if they should kill someone with a nosebleed that's passed out, that person in question could mutate and kill the rest of the people while they debate. But in some cases, right as the nosebleed symptoms occur, some people instantly become hostile with mutations that can be enough to wipe you out. They can transform soon right after the first nosebleed. Also keep in mind, if you're alone in a condensed apartment complex, neighborhood, building with multiple rooms, or any other populated area where everyone has done their fair share and boarded up and quarantined, who's to say other survivors that have done the same nearby won't transform in their isolation, being alone with their thoughts in this solitary voice? Would you be able to resist temptations in this voice in your head chipping away at your psyche while you are alone? Or would you be able to do that even if you are with some people? While your neighbors mutate, they can sense your presence or even hear even the slightest noise in your area to find you and bust through a wall or impale you through a window. As a side note, I do have to bring this up. What other kinds of monsters could be created with other desires not discovered? For example, would a person with a desire to fly grow wings and sharpen talons in a similar fashion to the bat monster only seen in the webcomics? Would a strongly introverted person forced to be in the presence of other survivors in order to survive have a deep desire to become secluded again, causing them to mutate in a sort of chameleon-like creature? able to either camouflage or even go invisible, and if humans were to step near their safe space, would attack them with a reptile-like tail? Or a suggestion by stressed Mexican pumpkin on Twitter, someone with insomnia and daily exhaustion having the desire to sleep, maybe mutating into a beast with closed eyes and a sloth-like appearance, and a tentacled tail similar to the tongue of the tongue beast, that can inject people with gamma amino butric acid or GABA to invade the brain and force others into a deep sleep or even causing sleep paralysis so that it maybe can feed on its defenseless victim or just spectate them in their slumber until they eventually die from malnutrition. Or would a person trying to overcompensate with the Ford F-150 and a desperate desire to get laid grow a giant dick and impale survivors with it? What do you think? What kind of monster would you turn into if you succumb to the Crew Crew disease? What kind of desire do you think you have? Let's discuss below in the comments. However, as we saw in a few occasions, there are those that can overcome this voice and keep it suppressed and controlled for over two weeks, and having the capability to survive deadly situations and become half monsters, and eventually a special infectee or evolved human being. Sure, you could possibly become this type of creature, but these chances are wholeheartedly dependent on your psyche and will. Do you think you could overcome that? Maybe, maybe not. If an evolved human or special infectee were to come to fruition, depending on their intentions and mentality, they could see to wiping out droves of humans and even militaries without even breaking a sweat. 
reaching Alex Mercer levels of transforming their bodies to become weapons and absorbing people in a flash, while full-on monsters around them pretty much bow to their presence, or at least refuse to fight them unless provoked. And even if they were supposedly killed and obliterated, these special infectees can regenerate by the molecular level and continue their killing spree until monsters inherit the Earth completely. As seen in the show's ending, or season finale, I don't know what it is quite yet, an unstoppable force that seeks out other half-monsters and evolved in order to manipulate them to come to their side in order to start a race war to wipe out humanity isn't far from reality, as I could see some edgy people out there coming to the conclusion that humanity is a fear-filled blight that must be extinguished. For the greater part of mankind, whether this is a curse or a virus, unless a majority of us can exist beyond our desires, we will be nothing more than dead, ripped-apart bodies on the streets that struggled to stay alive, or monsters that aimlessly roam the land with only one desire fulfilled, but still on our mind, or do more with our existence and evolve beyond our relentless need to satisfy our desires, but destroy the very species we evolved from. Well, that about covers those monsters under your bed. What did you think about the series? Do you hope for a season two? Was the webcomic better? Did I get something wrong? Did I not explain enough? What do you want to see next? Let me know in the comments, and again, let me know your ideas for desires that could create new monsters. I binge watched the show in one night, staying up till 8 a.m., and have to say it was neat, but went all over the place near the end but still a good watch. Thanks to Wisefish for editing my rambling together. Make sure to check out his channel for game reviews and analysis. I'll probably be working on a little something by Ridley Scott here soon, and maybe even getting a little craving for some bananas after that, so stay tuned. If you want to support the channel in a number of ways you can, by being a longtime donator, a Patreon patron, a YouTube channel member, or just donating during my live streams and you can have your name up right here. You can click one of the videos above to check out my other Why You Wouldn't Survive scenarios. And like always, stay happy, stay healthy, try to keep those desires in check, and most importantly, stay wow. Well.